Hello, welcome to Disrupting Doctors Careers again. And you may know that a few weeks ago, we ran one of our masterclasses for the Doctors in Industry Incubator, which was on how to get into pharma in 2023. Why that masterclass? Well, we know that loads and loads of doctors are interested in pharma as a career, but the actual main challenge they face besides understanding what pharma actually involves is the actual getting in. And sometimes doctors, it can, can take years to get a job that they really love within the industry. Um, so as part of our commitment to doctors exploring alternative careers, here is a podcast on that very matter. And we've been so, so, so fortunate to have Mayor Joshi, who is a global medical affairs lead for some of the top five pharma companies and he is the founder of Joshi Life Sciences. He'll tell us more about this but he has a really uh, a wealth of knowledge. He's got a wealth of knowledge in this area so if you are looking to get into pharma listen to every single letter that he says <laughs> the next half an hour because that could change your life literally change your life. Anyway, welcome, Mayor. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks, Abena. Thanks for having me on. How was that intro? <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's deep dive in and start with some of the, yeah, the, the questions that people don't always ask, but it's really important in interviews. So why does the pharma sector need doctors? Oh, I mean, loads of reasons. And I think Actually, recently, or I would say in the last 10 years, there's been a lot more doctors coming into industry. And, and essentially, mm. it's, it's that we're all, um, you know, deep scientific kind of expertise. We understand how to read science and, and bring it through to clinical practice. And I think that's a really important aspect of what pharma companies need and, and biotech companies need. They need to understand, right, you've got science, but how does that actually work in practice in 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 the mm -hmm. clinical space right so doctors are uniquely positioned for that because we're able to take on the science because we learn it through we're trained how to learn and interpret science but then we're also applying it in clinical practice it's not just doctors but other clinical practitioners um but they work across the entire um organization right the way from preclinical uh research to the clinical development program and then through into commercialization um, and also, depending on the career path you take, you'll, you could end up in regulatory, you could be a, be a re regulatory affairs specialist, you could work in um, safety, obviously a really important aspect of the industry, and then medical affairs, which is where I've had most of my experience within the industry. Um, and, and, you know, within, within these organizations, doctors pretty much touch every aspect of the the business you know i was in conversations with supply chain and procurement talking about importance the, the sort of clinical need for these medicines so that we don't get any interruption in supply that type of stuff right the way through to working with sales, sales mm -hmm. and marketing to sort of make sure that messages are you know appropriate and and strategy developing an appropriate strategy that kind of stuff so it's really that combination of scientific background clinical applicability and then you know there are a lot of transferable skills that i think doctors don't realize that they have which are really useful within within the industry so broadly speaking our presence is becoming much more prominent and we're becoming a lot more influential within these organizations and of course all the scientific roles are there but then a lot of doctors are now also taking their expertise into the commercial side of the business as well so working in for example mm. business development uh identifying future targets um future kind of companies that are doing amazing science but you, you bring them into these larger companies or even more highly commercial roles like um marketing heads that kind of thing because we bring that scientific expertise through and that clinical expertise which means that we're now sort of able to interact with with the external environment in a different way so you're not purely marketing you can have that scientific head on as well so there's a lot of places where doctors end up and of course we have mm. a few ceos globally who are doctors as well i think that's really interesting i mean the general take that i get on on the opportunities for doctors and pharma is that actually it's quite broad and there's and doctors with a whole variety of different skill sets 
there's always somewhere where they can really add value, fit in well and grow and thrive um, as leaders in the sector. Is that? Is yeah, that 100%. Percent? I think there are entry points that are more accessible for doctors into industry. But once you're in, I think then everything opens up. And, and also, it, I guess it depends on the organization that you're in and the types of companies you're working in as well, their openness to sort of have these transfers across um, internally. Uh, but I generally, in my experience, that's mm-hmm. been pretty, especially in the biggest companies, they you, to, you do tend to be able to do those sort of sideways transfers. But then in the smaller companies, you inevitably wear many hats anyway. So you, you sort of develop your skill sets across the different parts of the business. So, yeah, but I think entry points into pharma are pretty, uh, not so broad. So, like, if you're a doctor coming from clinical medicine, you're un, very unlikely to come in as a as a marketing head, right? But um, once you're in, you can develop that skill set and demonstrate you have that ability um, and, then, and then come across, um, which I've seen happen a number of times. Great. So it's literally about finding your in and then growing within the yeah. sector. So it's literally. I think so. Yeah. I think that's the bit that's, I wouldn't say it's the hardest bit, but it's certainly, it feels like the hardest challenge. But once you're in, then there's obviously different challenges that you need to navigate. You're always learning. It's just a different challenge. Um, um, and, it, you know, we have to think about, I think doctors traditionally think about progress as hierarchical. Right, moving up and up and up. Where actually, for me, progress can be yes, progress yes. can be just learning and moving into di- learning different parts of the business, so that you can then maybe bring that experience back into mm-hmm. medical or back into what you want to be doing, and um, and so you're expanding your knowledge. That's also progression. So there's a lot of stuff that doctors come into the industry with, like baggage, which you know I help I've helped many people sort of try and get rid of, but you have to navigate that as well. So yeah, I think the entry point mm-hmm. is. Tell me yeah. more. I was going to say, like, what what kind of what kind of baggage do okay. doctors well, come in with? Just so we can clarify that for some of our listeners, if they're not sure, you know, well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear that because we know that we, we you know a lot of doctors yeah. are leaving uh, their conventional clinical roles and looking for other alternatives, whether that's in wider um, clinical specialties or completely nothing to do with health. Um, and we know that obviously part of the push factors can be related to their well-being, burnout, how they've been treated or perceived to be treated in their work environment. So how does that present as maybe obstacles to, to, for, for further growth as they develop in the yeah. industry role? Or even just getting yeah, I think that that first bit you're talking about in terms of those push factors uh, is always, I think, a, a challenge, right? Because uh, in terms of getting into industry, I've interviewed a lot of people where they talk about why they want mm. to leave the NHS rather than why they want to join the industry, yeah. right? I think there's a, it's a nuance, but it's it. we all know. I mean, I've been there. There was a reason I wanted to leave the NHS. But the overriding factors for me in terms of what mm-hmm. I was attracted to, that's the piece I focused on. It's that future looking statement. Why do I want to join that organization or that industry and that organization and that team? Those are the factors that I would look for more importantly over and above. Oh, you know, the NHS is this, the NHS is that, right? So th- that's one aspect to it. But once doctors are in I find as well because like I said earlier the NHS is very hierarchical the teams that we work in are hierarchical um, you you do find that doctors who've been in the industry for a little while and and have a, a certain level of seniority can sometimes come in with that sim- same attitude if you you know when I was a physician I was a, I worked in a surgical I was a general surgical trainee for a little while and then locumed but that hierarchical aspect hierarchical aspect is really prominent right and you get told what to do just do this do this do this yeah. and and yeah. you are and as you get more senior you're the person doing the telling even at a registrar level right so you come into the industry and you do see some doctors behaving in that way right oh you're just this you're the marketing mm. person listen to me type thing mm. but what doctors don't seem those types of doctors mm. don't seem to understand is there you're coming into a environment where these people are experts in what they do they're experts in that product they're experts in that yes. particular science you're yes. coming in with a certain skill set that is needed in the business but you should respect what's around you and the hier- hierarchy mm. there is of course hierarchy but it's not depending on the company and, and i've been lucky enough not 
to work in anywhere that's super hierarchical and directive. Um, but generally speaking, mm -hmm. that hierarchy is kind of, it, work, it, it doesn't, the businesses that work well don't necessarily enforce that hierarchy. You respect the talents that are in there, right? So in, in the NHS, you as the registrar mm -hmm. surgeon, you know more than everyone below you. So you're kind of training them and directing them and this is what you need to do. I've got X, that X hundred number of hours of surgical experience. I'm going to teach you how to do that. Whilst as a leader within a farmer organization, you build your teams differently. So I build my teams where I want their expertise to be better than mine. And I'm sort of building, building oh, yeah, teams so. that then I can, I can sort of uh, influence and navigate and, and, and sort of conduct um, or, you know, so I'm sort of acting in that sort of way uh, so that someone has very specialist technical knowledge in clinical trial management or, or whatever it is. Right. And, and you're going through somebody else is very strategic. Somebody else has got project management skills and all of them might be more, smarter than me. But um, that's how we build out the team. So it's, mm -hmm. it is different. Right. And, and when so when you see these doctors coming in, you see these the ones that make these mistakes, they don't ask enough questions. They're not curious enough. They're not open to learning. They, they build on, they're trying to build on their hierarchy. Mm -hmm. They're not used to coming in and being told you're now at the bottom of the rung, even mm -hmm. though you're quite senior in an organization, you're at the bottom of the rung mm -hmm. in the function. So, um, so you see yeah. some of these. But then how, how do they manage to get through the interviews and then it only comes up once they've worked in the organization? Like, how do you filter that out or identify whether they're the right? Yeah, so it depends on the type. It, it depends on the interviewer and what they're looking for. So, again, I think a lot of people um, mm -hmm. when you're interviewing, and this isn't just necessarily in pharma and biotech, but people interview and they go, oh, this this person's the best person on paper and this person's excelled at the interview and they don't think about actually what's the team look like what's our people strategy what's our organizational strategy yes. how does our organizational design fit yes. and what do they need so sometimes the person that's absolutely smashed the interview and has every single technical skill set in there they've done it but you haven't actually asked the right questions for your for your organizational fit so you end up with mm. them, they come in and then you go, oh, wow, okay, they're not quite what I want. So you haven't thought that, I've seen it a lot, right? So you see these guys come in and, mm. and, and they've been brought in because of this amazing CV, but actually their fit with the team is you're just replicating somebody else that's in the team. They're not, it's not a complementary skill set or it's not something that is, you're just yeah. getting that best guy on paper because you've not really thought through your organizational and people strategy. So this is, that's on the kind of interviewer and, and the, and the, and the company because they're trying to hoover up talent instead of really understanding what their individual team needs. This is about team building teams rather than getting the best people, if that makes sense, right? The most qualified person isn't necessarily the best person to join your team because you might just need somebody who yeah. delivers on a project or you might need a certain skill set like you need like so in my last well I've, I've had a number of different teams but one of the teams um everyone was highly technical very intelligent lots of technical expertise across clinical trials across medical affairs um and excellent delivering projects but they were kind of siloed in their in their t in the team right they were just sort of delivering what they needed to deliver without understanding the wider strategy and that comes from leadership. So when I came in, I sort of looked at it and went, all right, this is what I need. So the new hires that came in were people who were great at strategic, like strategic thinking, ability to join the dots, that storytelling piece. So you're sort of now complementing the skill set already in there. And this is kind of sometimes missed, especially in entry level roles where you kind of just you sort of go, oh, I've got an entry level role um that i could feel with a doctor let's get the one that's the best on paper and the best this and the best that but actually you mm -hmm. you miss that what's their complementary skill set for the team so that that's one of the challenges but mm -hmm. but essentially these these guys that come mm -hmm. in they don't ask enough questions they don't respect the expertise across the team and, and you see that come through and it takes time for them mm -hmm. to to settle in it's mm -hmm. a bit like you know when you're an so f1 when... So an F1 doctor and you come in and you see yeah. the one, the F1s that totally disregard the nurses. And then after a time, you re they realize, oh, oh, I need, they're the bosses, actually. I need to make sure they're on side. It's a bit like that, actually. They come in and they disregard all these people because they think they're the expert. And then they eventually learn. 
But I think the reason they think they're the experts, they haven't, because that that's the culture that they've learned from their seniors. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know no, I mean? exactly, yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's a difficult lesson to learn. And so just taking you back to some of the, a few things that you've said, so talking about, say, for example, the interview, and you've mentioned several times about it's really important that they ask the right questions in the interview. So, I mean, you've interviewed a lot of people. Can you give us any examples of what are good questions as to in, ask as the doctor being interviewed, um, so to speak? Because I always see interviews as like it's totally a two-way yeah. process. Um, it's not necessarily transactional. And actually, as you said, the more curious you are um, in the interview, the kind of better that you come across. But also it's it's you as an individual de determining whether the company is the right culture fit for you and vice versa. But like what kind of questions have, have come up where you think actually this person's really reflected and, and actually gets us or you know, is, is, is more about their values and culture, which is important, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, it, it, it's usually quest. Well, first of all, it is exactly what you've said, right? They've treated it like a two way, two way process to a certain extent. Um, so they're understanding that I need to fit into this mm. organization. So it's usually things like um, the questions that I like to hear, they're not necessarily around culture specifically. They don't say, oh, what's the culture like? Although that's that's probably a decent question, right? But everyone says the culture. It's quite diff well, it's a difficult question to ask. Like, what do people say? What's yeah, the culture you can like? ask. Uh, and then you get... You know, uh, it gets yeah, thrown yeah. around, but it's like actually how, 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 how are people made to feel... Yeah. And that in itself. Yeah, but I think you if know, you if you have some, yeah. I, I'm quite an honest and transparent interviewer. So I'll say this is what it's like in my team. This is what it's yeah. like across the business. We're still learning about yeah. this, and we're still developing in this area. Yeah. You you know that kind of stuff. But the mm -hmm. the questions that tend to be you know the ones that I like and we really get into it are you know what are, what problem am I mm -hmm. coming in to solve? How am I going to help this team? Um, what is it that you're looking mm -hmm. for from in this role? Um, uh, you know, that it's that more, it's what I've talked about, you know, earlier around, I've gone in with a specific, uh, strategy in terms of the people, people strategy and the team building strategy. And I've now got this hiring process that I'm going through so that I can build out mm -hmm. that team. And so when, if I can have that conversation with somebody, they can get a good understanding of actually, this is what I'm looking for as a hiring manager. Does that person have that skill set? And, and, you know, I will also, I will be quite transparent about it and say that I need somebody who's going to be able to come in, see the bigger picture, um, join the dots, think with me strategically, bounce ideas off me or, or whatever it is. Right. And then if there's someone who's more technical, looking at clinical trial assets and things like that. And I know this. Right. Because I'll have seen their CV and I'll have interviewed them. I'm looking at insight. Do they have self-awareness that they go, OK, well, yeah, that's probably not my thing. Or they'll go, okay, that's interesting. We haven't talked about that side of my profile and my CV doesn't bring that out, but here's mm -hmm. some of the things that I've done that demonstrate that. So they, they sort of pick up where pick up mm -hmm. where they might have a gap and then they'll bring it out in the conversation. And I, I deliberately ask those, will deliberately mm -hmm. ask questions which will hopefully bring it out where maybe their CV doesn't sell them properly, but I've seen something that I like. Uh, and then in the interview process, I'll give them the opportunity mm -hmm. to bring that out, right? So um, it, it's those kinds of questions that are more like self-aware, insightful, like in terms of they are they understand what they want out of a, a role rather than I, I can always spot somebody who's just mm -hmm. like, I need a role. Mm -hmm. I want a role. And that's it. I don't really care, right? Because and then yeah. it's, it's, it's not quite yeah. so in, it's not an interesting conversation. It's a very scripted kind of conversation no. and and you know you're always told to practice and prepare but do but do many of those doctors that i was gonna say do, but do those doctors actually make it to interview well you make place? it to interview do you know what i mean because like the desperation kind of does come across you make it to interview earlier on in that process it depends so. on what your process looks like right so i've been if i see somebody who's got a cv that i like then you may not meet them until that and you know you just meet them and then you realize, okay, this is where it's coming through, but the CV looks good. Um, and a lot of the process, it, it, even if you, there's like a three stage process, it's not really stages. It's just three interviews that you're meeting. You don't, I haven't been, I haven't yeah. led pro, it's, 
processes where there's a number of different stages myself it'll be right meet a few different people maybe mm -hmm. meet us all at once and then then and then we'll look at the best candidates and bring you back to meet me and somebody else maybe um so yeah you do see them so it's like a kind of 360 degree type yeah approach. We, yeah Six, yeah that we've, we i usually get um cross-functional colleagues in as well because i, I not just yes. medical colleagues and i also get in other my, like my peers so people from other teams i'll ask them will you sit in on this interview with me and and have a chat to this guy i, I just get your opinion on him and stuff uh so so i do try and get a good view and i always always listen to um the hr person and talent acquisition person um as well i put them into a mm -hmm. i don't i don't have like a a screening stage um I, do, I just bring people in to the first kind of pool of interviews and ask them their opinion as well. And then I'll sort of select mm -hmm. like the two that I like mm -hmm. or we like as a group um, and then take them through mm -hmm. to like meet me and my boss. That That's kind of how I've done it. Um, everyone is different. Everywhere is different. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So you have to be wary of kind of like automated mm -hmm. screening stuff. Sometimes the talent acquisition people will have that first look and that first call and then screen you out or in. Uh, I, I like to be more involved. It just mm -hmm. depends on the individual. Interesting, because obviously there's concern about bias happening very early on in that recruitment process. And, you know, inevitably, there are lots of really great people out there just missing out on this opportunity. So I guess my, my other question is, I think one of the challenges that doctors, I think anyone actually facing going to pharma is finding out more about, A, who's interviewing them. I and mean, obviously it depends on the department and the team. Um, and B, yeah, really understanding like what, what are they looking for? So, so they don't waste your time, so to speak. And I know that, you know, some people haven't been able to speak to the hiring managers ahead of time. And so, so my question, going to my question, how can doctors better prepare themselves to one, applying um, for pharma jobs and two, actually preparing for the interview? What are your top tips? On yeah, I think one? the main one for entry level is really getting to grips and understanding the role and the function that you're applying for. Usually it's medical affairs and it, you know, and I'm talking from experience, right? <laughs> My first interview I went to, I, I wasn't even expecting to get an interview because I just signed up to this recruitment agency and I went in and I had no idea about what I was applying for, what I was, who I was talking mm -hmm. to, just because it happened very mm -hmm. quickly. And I didn't really understand medical affairs. I didn't understand what they were looking for. And it ended up being them telling me a lot of stuff. So, which I learned a lot from, but I obviously didn't get the job. Um, so I, I would say it's really understand the environment that you're applying for and why you're applying and what it is that doctors do in that role, right? I mentioned earlier, there are a ton of things that doctors do in a pharma company. So you really need to understand what the function is that you're going, you're applying for, um, what, what they actually do, right? So it's a good question to also ask in an interview as an entry level person is maybe, you know, what does my day, to, what will my day to day look like? I know that doctors do this, this and this in medical affairs, but day to day, what am I going to be doing? Um, that's another kind of I like that question because it, you know, it, you can learn about stuff outside in, but you start to get it from the people that you, you really are going to be working with. So the tips would be, look, I'm open as an individual when people get in touch with me. I, you know, I, this is kind of how I started helping people was just people randomly uh, messaging me on LinkedIn, or it'll be a friend of a friend, or actually I've helped like a few of my own, like best friends get into the industry. Um, but essentially just, trying to message people contact network as much as you can um and again like when i started out there was no one doing the stuff that you're doing right um helping so those kind that kind of engagement is important so you're just learning it's all about learning and asking questions that never changes once you're in as well it's mm -hmm. all about learning curiosity uh learning agility these are the these are things i look for um and, that, and that's what you do. And, and look, you, you may get knocked back from people. They may go, I don't have the time, but well, you haven't lost anything. You've just, you're back where you started, right? Um, but most people are pretty open. They'll say, yeah, I'll give you 15 minutes or whatever. I had someone contact me and they badgered me for ages. Um, I say badgered 
but like I, I met with them virtually and then they badgered me to come in and meet the rest of the team. We both know this person. And he, he badgered me and, and, in, <laughs> and in the end I brought him in and, and look, he, he got in, but that's persistence. I didn't mind it because he, I say badgered because it's a joke between us, but didn't he get like five job offers as a result of that? Probably, maybe not from me. <laughs> 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 no, I'm joking. I'm joking. He did. He did. That, that was that narrative not too long ago. No, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> I, you no, know, persistence is important because it shows as long as you're not sort of, mm-hmm. you know what? People love it. They love it when you sort of say to them, oh, I'd love some advice. Oh, I'd, I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Oh, I'd love to get, you know, your expertise on this. And, oh, yeah, I am an expert. Huh, let, me, let me have a chat with this guy. So, you know, that's what I would say in terms of that uh-huh. kind of networking piece. But then there's also more formal stuff around um, events, companies that do put on um, um, learning events, introductory things. I know a few recruitment agencies that will put on an intro to pharma kind of day and you go and meet lots of senior people. I've attended a few of those. Like I said, your company, there are other organizations that are working through things. So it is about networking and asking questions. I think though, trying to get in front of the hiring manager to ask them what they're looking for as an entry level, it's not really, I wouldn't, I'd just be like, look, you just got to go through the process. Not because I'm not open to that conversation. It's just that it's an entry level role. So there's pretty much standard requirements that we're looking for. And it's does that, that conversation isn't going to help you. And I'm kind of not. Mm. But then how about for senior yeah, level yeah. roles? So obviously we've got doctors going to pharma, uh, you know, from, you know, the minute they fall out of yeah. FY2 to, to, consultants and so what what would you say for for those yeah i think that's a bit and trying to get into kind of medical director roles how, how do that, i how think that's different that? i think you can but again seniority in the nhs doesn't give you what you necessarily need to be a senior person within the industry right so unless you are talking mm-hmm. about so we, let's move away from medical affairs we're talking more around the clinical development piece so you've run clinical trials you are a top mm-hmm. tier expert in your field usually that is a conversation that you're you're having yourself because you're running clinical trials for these companies you don't need to you're almost not really foraging for these roles they kind of will come and talk to you about it because you you know you could just pop a note into the clinical development team that you're talking to and just say or the boss or if you're at that level you know probably the um you might even know the ceo right because it depends on the therapy area and stuff you just drop a note that's all it is so that's what happens i've seen it again quite mm-hmm, a few times mm-hmm. um because that but, but those roles are very highly technical your skill set is already attuned to that because you've run these clinical trials and you've been on advisory boards for these companies. You're you're a top tier expert for these guys already, anyway. So then, for the offering that you're bringing, is got it's not really your. It's it's what they've already seen anyway. So you're coming in as a as a therapy area expert that you, and you're helping in that kind of therapy area strategy. I haven't seen people come into the other areas like medical affairs, for example. Um, at a you, straight in at a kind of like let's say people manager level or at a um, um, director level I haven't seen that myself it may have happened but my personal experience I haven't done because there's so much more to the role than just your technical expertise yeah. um, and depth of technical expertise mm-hmm. is actually not necessarily the main requirement in those roles right so I like I said earlier I was a surgical trainee and then I locumed as a surgeon I'm now yeah. I've worked now across multiple therapy areas neurosciences, um, ophthalmology, um, liver, other surgical specialties as well. And and it's not the, I mean, I can learn the technical stuff and the the science and the clinical stuff. That's, that's not, we're all trained to do that, right? Um, but it's the other bits that I bring. That's my kind of personal profile. So in medical affairs, that technical yeah. expertise mm-hmm. isn't necessarily the only thing that we're looking for. Um, so, so yeah, those yeah. those senior level people looking to break into industry will usually come in at a senior level, right? Because they've already been working with these companies. So I, I yeah. don't really, I haven't helped those people because I can't. Yeah. I, I, that's not my area. They tend to sort of do it with, mm-hmm. with they know everyone anyway. Yeah. Okay. I'm just moving on, actually. Can I just yep. pause? Because I can hear my baby c- crying and I don't know what's going on. Hold on. Sorry. No one second. 
Uh, yes. So I've I just had we had just had a pause because I had to attend my baby. <laughs> I like to include that in the podcast. This is the reality of working from Absolutely. home and being a relatively, I say, relatively new mother of two who were two yeah. and under. My my, so. my youngest, <laughs> my youngest attended multiple meetings. Like my my chief medical officer saw him kind of go because it was lockdown, right? So everything was virtual. So he was just getting a bit older yeah. and older in each meeting. And then and then, and then she met him once we moved to Basel. It's quite funny. So he's been in in like all of these super senior meetings and everyone just kind of knows him. Um, now yeah, he wouldn't yeah. he wouldn't he wouldn't survive now because he's just like straight screaming and shouting. So but yeah, at least then he was a bit he was a yeah. bit more settled. Yeah. So, yeah, this one's going to you're going to hang out with us, aren't you? Anyway, so we're going to learn a little bit more about, I wanted to ask you about your experience of coaching and mentoring in your role or helping other doctors. How does that add value to doctors coming into pharma and progressing in pharma? Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I'll tell you about my experience, right? I think the key piece is, first of mm. all, real understanding of the industry, what they're looking for, and and then how to maximize yourself like what it what is it that you bring that other people don't bring i think that's the the piece that most people miss it's that it's not about telling you to say this or do that or whatever i mean there is a bit of that and, and sometimes you need to do it but it's more about a, a frame of mind and an approach to thinking and understand and sort of that that approach to problem solving right and 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 how you approach these different yeah. aspects of it so for me i still have a coach um in my own sort of career because of course mm -hmm. i'm still working in the industry but um for me it's about my kind of executive leadership and and sort of developing that side of stuff learning more around people leadership even though i've done it for a long time but it's also always learning and always progressing right that's one piece for myself when i've helped people it's usually you know, a, a, a medical, a, a doctor's CV, right, when you're in the NHS is very kind of, is matter of fact, it doesn't, you don't really sell yourself, you're just going, I've done this, I'm a, I was a locum consultant for, for six months, I did it, and you just sort of go through and then you've got all your million um, publications and whatever else you've done. And yeah. it's usually a like 30 page long CV, right, I've seen these come in. But it's really not what yeah, I would yeah, um, go for. I mean, I don't think that it's possible to have a one page CV. Like, I don't necessarily believe that for a medic, but it's about understanding. And this is what I do, right? What, where I've helped people. First of all, it's not just the CV itself, but it's understanding your whole, your whole self. What's your story? And I think, um, I mean, a lot of people call it what's your personal brand. It's a very kind of LinkedIn type um, phrase, but it's really what's your story? What's the story you're trying to tell about yourself? What do you bring that's different? What do you, what have you, what can yeah. I, what, what can you do for me almost as a hiring manager? How are you going to help me solve my problems? How are you going to help me deliver on my goals as an organization? So that's where I really help people initially, mm -hmm. right? That's that initial piece, getting to know yourself, getting to know your differentiating mm -hmm. factors almost, and then understanding how to apply that. But really where the massive value mm -hmm. I, I, I've i seen with people that I've worked with is, like I said earlier, is that, that approach to things, that, that how you're approaching stuff is really important. Um, approaching it with curiosity, approaching it with an, a framework of, um, I, I know I can work this out, even though I have no idea what it is right now, right? What's the, you know, it's, it's all about identifying yeah, yeah, the problem yeah. statement, then understanding what you bring to that in terms of, creative solutions and strategic yeah. thinking and then it's kind of go around well, who else do mm -hmm. i need to bring in it's sort of that understanding uh, and that's where i really help people go from i know how to deliver a ton of projects at high volume to now i am a strategic leader and can start understanding the where i need to bring different people in how yeah. i need to manage these different projects and and delivering loads of projects yeah. at high volume i can get anybody to do that right but you as a doctor i need your 
I need you to bring your clinical expertise. I need you to bring your the way all the stuff that you did as a doctor in the NHS, problem solving. You know, when you're presenting a yeah. patient history, it's all about storytelling, right? Really to get it right. You understand the key yeah. bits of information when you're doing a handover. So it's now applying that yeah. in and understanding that you do have these skills and, and it's just about your your mental approach and your framework. And that's where I've, I've seen the most uh, value um, once people are in the industry, right? That kind of stuff is later on as you're developing in your in yourself as a leader. And when I say a leader, I don't mean a people manager. I mean a leader in your role. You're occupying. My old, one of my old mm-hmm. chief medical officers used to say, occupy your space, right? Know where it is you're going to have your influence and how to influence others but also understand when it's the right time to bring other people in but really understanding how what that means to occupy your space as an individual or even as a team leader or as a therapeutic area head or whatever it is um yeah but in that first instance it is more of that sort of I don't want to say transactional, but it is more of that kind of CV review, understand yourself, even helping with that first 90 days in an organization, right? That's super important. Yeah. Understanding, having a plan yeah. for that and going through that is, is yeah. super important. So these are the areas that have mm-hmm. helped people. Um, and mm-hmm. I've been helped myself, right, in in mm. the industry. Is that is that is that generally offered um, in in pharma companies for any any right workers, any so the first is there a culture of oh yeah 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 i mean that's the idea yeah there is yeah there should be right because you're trying to mm-hmm. you pharma companies they you you invest a lot of money in getting these people in and then training them up and and obviously doctors mm-hmm. are not cheap right relatively speaking um yes, so yeah exactly yeah. and so you invest yeah you're right it's an investment so you don't want to then realize later on oh my god they've completely drowned right but it's also on the individual like myself as a team leader let's say as a manager i don't want my team to be underperforming i it reflects if i'm being completely selfish reflects badly on me right so for me as well it's kind of like if i'm getting to a point where somebody's drowning and unable to survive then it's it's kind of my job to help them come through that Sometimes they're just completely not the right fit. I've had maybe in my my whole career, maybe one person that fits that I can remember that person. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's just not, it just didn't work out. It's just not the right fit, completely wrong state of mind. And there are reasons why they ended up in the role, which I've learned from, right? So, but generally speaking, yes, you, you do coach. I would say prior to getting into industry, there isn't that structured help within the nhs right this is one of my challenges when i was trying to leave back in the day um nobody is gonna nobody wants to help you because the nhs has invested in you as well right there's no kind of program in the nhs so companies like yours uh individuals that are are just open to helping out um you've got to search them out um and and really look for that i think i think the biggest challenge that we've we've recognized is that doctors aren't familiar with the concept of coaching and mentoring and more importantly the value that it can bring especially when it comes to making life decisions changing careers etc etc because that wasn't offered even though it is if you're listening though it is generally available in your trust and usually through like at the what's it called the psu professional support unit and maybe you're through a deanery or sometimes your own trust may organize it. Um, but it's something if you if you look into it and it's available to you, you should totally go 100%. for But also another important factor of that is find a coach that that aligns with your values. And this is one of the reasons why we have coaches on our sites who are all doctors or ex-doctors who are trained or have that expertise in supporting doctors who are transitioning to a whole like a diverse range of things. So sometimes you can get um coaches who are biased into uh, keeping you somewhere where you don't necessarily want to be if that makes any sense but anyway we're we're about to run out of time but what i really wanted to get into which we haven't covered at all so at the beginning of this before we started you mentioned that you're like a massive mammy fan (laughs) and actually have you've done a load of really amazing things um, when it came, when it comes outside of health completely, do you want to just outline what you have done, but also 
how it's complemented what you're doing now. Yeah, I'm, I, I, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm a man. I am a massive Manchester United fan, <laughs> and um, there will be people listening that will hold that against me. But I used to have a season ticket, travel around Europe. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I currently live in Basel, and the first time I went to Basel was to watch Man United. So. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of got into, I guess, you know, you everyone, a lot of people on social media and you, you maybe build a following. And then I got asked to write a few blogs, small ones. And over time, I've ended up writing articles for uh, magazines like 442 or World Soccer Mag. Um, and then I've been on a number of different um, podcasts podcasts and youtube channels that are now massive um and um and i've written chapters in books like anthology books and stuff so that's kind of really uh well it's good fun i like it and you know yeah. it's kind of taking something that i'm not so involved in it anymore but it took something that i was just like enjoy doing to a fairly high level for someone who's not trained in any of that kind of stuff right so um i think yeah. the key bit around all of that is is that again it's curiosity it's like what can you do how you know how can you, can you do? exactly it's just asking that question and, and being open to opportunities mm -hmm. right so if someone asks you oh would you like to do a podcast yes yeah why not let's have a chat and and see where it goes and it may not work out might not be for you but um you know i remember yeah. the first kind of youtube video i did with the channel they asked it they asked everyone loads of people to just send in videos of them talking about stuff and and you kind of feel a bit weird just looking recording something on your phone and trying to be enthusiastic on your own and but you do it and then eventually i got into it now it's not like a r massive revenue generator or anything like that but it adds value or it did when i had the time for me because i just enjoyed doing it and it was kind of cool but through that i've, I've ended up meeting loads of really amazing people um, I've been on all sorts of other stuff as well in, in, in terms of um, media and, and whatever and, and meeting former footballers and I've traveled uh, I've traveled uh, I've managed to get tickets for football matches I wouldn't have got <laughs> so, yeah. did any of this come out in any of the interviews when you were getting into <laughs> pharma like talking about what you've done outside yeah of and did it resonate? it's a question I so saw I the way I position it is more kind of I I'm always asking the question, like, what can I learn and how, what can I do? Like, I'm really um, curious about things, right? So, you know, it, you know, it will be things like um, that. It might be that, or it might be, oh, you know, I've written, um, I've helped co-author white papers on emerging technology and healthcare, like blockchain and, and things like that. Or it'll be something completely different. Like, you know, I post on my LinkedIn about books that I've read and usually, they're about, I don't know, leadership or whatever, but the ones that I love reading the most tend to be around like physics, astrophysics or quantum mechanics or something like that. So it's just a different um, topic to talk about. And it just shows a little bit of, again, it show, for me, if I speak to someone and we get off on, 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 on a different tangent, it shows that inherent innate curiosity, learning agility, um, you know, that those are, these are attributes that you, it's really difficult to, teach and it's really difficult to sort of put on a black and white cv right um and those are the things that sort of i do like that's a personal preference but i think those people end up making excellent leaders because they're always learning and they they're just fascinated by by i am like just fascinated by random stuff right i'll just dive into a into a topic and end up i'll be reading for it but for hours doesn't mean i know it or i'm an expert in it but it's just the kind of thing that i end up doing and, and, you know, it just shows that, like I say, that inherent curiosity and, and willingness to learn. And I think that's super important. Absolutely. And I, I it resonates for me as an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah, can hear me. It resonates for me as an entrepreneur. And yeah, just always be learning, always be curious. And what else can I do? Anyway, I'm going to end on that note. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, Maya, and uh, we're hoping that you can get more involved in the Doctors and in Industry uh, Incubator program because of your expertise and also because of your values. That's one thing that really struck out to me. Uh, just to give a little bit of history, Maya, when we we're connected, we're doctors and we've got very similar networks. And Maya reached out on LinkedIn and it kind of landed at exactly the right moment. And so things have happened quite quickly, yeah. really, hasn't it? <laughs> save a line um but yeah we're exploring how we can really work together 
um, and add value to what we're both doing. So like, again, this is an example of how networks and networking and just really knowing what you're looking for and what you need, knowing what your strengths are, knowing where other people could add a value to your journey and your mission can really mm -hmm. end up with great, exciting things, which is also part of the learning Absolutely. Process. So um, thank you so much for your time. No, thank you for having me on. And uh, if anyone needs to, no worries, everyone needs to reach out to you, how best to do that? Um, LinkedIn is good. Uh, so just look me up, Dr. Mayur R. Joshi, or uh, my website, joshilifesciences.com. So you can drop a contact through there as well. And yeah, if you're on LinkedIn, connect with me. That's good. Um, I'm still cultivating the social media stuff for my website i kind of separate it out from my football stuff uh, we don't want to muddy the waters <laughs> so we will do that but yeah my website or my linkedin is good yeah it might it might triage out some people <laughs> as you just described but there you go yeah. you know it's about the. Whole i will thing. work with liverpool it's fans just just so everyone knows there's no bias <laughs> there's no bias is that in that application <laughs> which, which i uh, will football? yeah uh, one of my old country managers like he was like super senior uh he was the head of the uk yeah. he was a liverpool fan massive he used to travel to games i come back sleep mm. in the office so he's ready for the next day and stuff and we i sometimes i'd forget he was like my boss's boss and on the like mm -hmm. massive like leadership teams and stuff and we would get into these football debates and we'd end up swearing at each other and then I'd be like oh my god I just called my boss's boss and a this that and the other and it was like oh I better calm down a little bit but it never got in the way so it's all good <laughs> awesome well thanks a lot Maya for your time and uh yeah thank you for listening everybody uh, if you get into pharma as a result of this podcast, all the masterclass we ran, please 100% let us know because, yeah, this is all gold. This is all gold. Thank you.